Okay, I'm going to be talking about the early part of the human fossil record, the Australopiths. Diet is the single most important parameter that underlies the behavioral and ecological differences among living primates. We know from studies of living primates that group size, group structure, positional behavior, locomotion, on and on and on, all of these and other things are affected by diet. And so if we can understand something about the diets of our ancestors, we should be able to say quite a bit about the lives of those ancestors. Also, diet is important from the perspective of understanding the role of a hominin in its environment. Since environmental change is supposed to be the trigger for human evolution, if we can understand something about diet and how that changes with environment, we can again say something about, in this case, how and why and where humans evolved. So it's very important to us paleoanthropologists to study diet. There are other reasons that we look at uh, diet of early hominins. These and many other books have sold millions and millions of copies. A lot of people believe that there's a discordance between what we eat today, what our ancestors evolved to eat, and that is why we have so many of the chronic degenerative diseases we have, obesity and so forth. One of my favorite quotes from any of these books uh, is Dr. Adkins' new diet, is from Dr. Adkins' new diet revolution. And uh, this particular book sold 15 million copies. Uh, he wrote, the human animal was able for millions of years to remain strong and healthy in conditions of often savage deprivation by eating the fish and animals that scampered and swam around him and the fruits and vegetables and berries that grew nearby. Um, okay. <laughs> Probably true. Uh, it's intuitive. But where did he get this? How, how, does, how did he know this? What do we really know about the diets of our ancestors from millions of years ago? And that's the question I'd like to address in this presentation. What is the actual hard evidence for the diets of human ancestors and our near cousins, the early hominins, of millions of years ago? And what can we really say about the diets of these hominins? Well, since no one else is going to do it, I guess I will. I'd like to, to quickly give those of you who are not familiar with the human fossil record a very quick, very down and dirty, very simplified um, preview or tour, if you will, of that fossil record. Basically, it stretches about 7 million years, and this, these are about I'm giving you here, and includes roughly four groups, or you can divide them into four groups. The first group you can call the earliest putative uh, hominins uh, from about 7 million years ago. This one's from Chad. These are, until we get to about here, they're all from Africa. Uh, and then from uh, Kenya and then Ethiopia. Uh, probably the best known of this group is Ardipithecus ramidus. These were, best we can tell, still largely in the trees. Uh, best we can tell, more or less woodland species, not unlike some chimpanzees today, presumably in terms of both the way they moved about the landscape and the sorts of things they ate. I'm not going to spend much time talking about them, largely because they're still under study and the dietary analyses are in progress today. I don't know as much about them either. The next group uh, is what we'd call the genus Australopithecus. There are several species of Australopithecus. I'm sure people in this room differ in the number of species they recognize, but that's OK. Uh, we've got some from Chad, but most of them come from East Africa. And this is the Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis, as well as South Africa. Uh, and this one here is uh, Australopithecus sediba, fairly recently discovered Fine. These ones had not abandoned the trees, but certainly had come down to the ground, and we have evidence of them walking around and in the way of footprints, things of that nature. Essentially, they lived from just over 4 million years ago, maybe 4.2, to just under 2 million years ago. The next group is a group we can call Paranthropus. These are one of two evolutionary forks in the road that happened something like 2.5 million years ago. Paranthropus are presumably our near cousins. They are relatives of ours. They presumably did not give direct rise to us. And yet they're interesting in their own right, largely because of the tremendous degree of specialization that they show. The fourth group is the group uh, Homo. The earliest members of our own genus show up in the fossil record about, say, 2.4 million years ago or so. And they continue up to the present, just under 2 million years, 1.85, 1.9. We get Homo erectus, which is more or less committed to the ground, the first 
common in species presumably to leave Africa, and so forth. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the latter three groups. What evidence do we have for diet? Well, teeth. Teeth are the best evidence, largely because they're the most common fossils we get in most vertebrate assemblages, and they're durable parts of the digestive system. They're, in fact, the only part of the body that comes in contact with food that we find in the fossil record. So if we can't get it out of teeth, we're probably not going to get it out of anything, at least at this point. Fortunately, there are predictable relationships between diet and the sizes, shapes, and structure of teeth. So for example, if we look at living primates, we can look at the sizes, shapes, and structures of their teeth and say, hey, these relate to these specific diets. And we can use that to infer something about diet from the sizes, shapes, and structures of teeth of the fossils. Likewise, teeth preserve what you can call food prints. These are traces of foods eaten, like footprints in the sand, if you will. They're actual traces or records of what an individual ate in the past. The best examples of these are the chemistry of the teeth and the wear, the use wear of the teeth. And these leave predictable patterns, too, we've established through studies of living primates between the pattern and the diet. So if we see the pattern in fossils, we should be able to infer something about the diet. So I'm going to talk about first Australopithecus, uh, this roughly four to two million year old series of species of hominins. They're also called the gracile Australopiths because at least compared to the other ones, their skulls are fairly slender, their jaws are fairly slender, not compared to us, but compared to the other Australopiths. And we'll talk about their teeth in a moment. Uh, the Paranthropus group from about two and a half million years ago to maybe 1.3 or so, they're called the robust Australopiths because their skulls and jaws are so big and heavy, and that makes them robust. And then we'll talk a little bit about Homo uh, from about two and a half million years, 2.4 million years onward. Again, just under two million years ago, Homo erectus. And they seem to show less of an emphasis on chewing anatomy, uh, particularly in the skull and the jaw. Okay, so what evidence do we have and what does it tell us? Let's start with tooth size. In theory, larger teeth mean more surface area. More surface area can be used for processing more food, typically low quality foods. Some have also argued that more surface area means greater probability of smashing into small food particles. If we look at living great apes, this seems to work fairly well. We've got a chimpanzee at the top. There's its uh, uh, three of its teeth. Then we've got an orangutan and a gorilla. And you see an increasing amount, on average, over the course of a year, across populations of leaf eating, low quality vegetation compared to soft fleshy fruits, as you go from one to the next to the next. And the actual amount of surface area, and these are scaled to the same size, does in fact increase. This doesn't work for all groups of primates, but it certainly works for our nearest living relatives, the great apes. What about the hominins? Well, hominins are really interesting because they have big teeth, bigger teeth than you might expect. Here is a Paranthropus third molar tooth. I think it's probably the biggest one uh, in, the, in the assemblage uh, as compared to a modern human tooth and they're sitting right next to each other in the museum. Some of them have incredibly large teeth. They're called megadont. And Australopithecus as a group has big cheek teeth. Paranthropus as a group has large molar, has huge molar teeth. And early Homo has on average smaller tooth sizes, especially from Homo erectus onward. We'll talk about what that means in just a moment, but let's go to tooth shape. Theory, blunt, flat teeth are good for crushing hard, brittle foods. Not because they're better at crushing foods, but because they're better at avoiding themselves being broken when you've got to put a lot of force on those teeth. So the best tooth really is probably a hemisphere, because if you try and crush hard food with something that's pointy, you're going to break the tooth. On the other hand, sharp teeth are better for shearing or slicing tough items. The best way to illustrate this is think of a hammer smashing a nut versus a, a, a knife cutting into steak or, cutting into, uh, or a pair of scissors cutting into a tough leaf. Different shaped teeth, different diets. And here we've got three old world monkey species. At the top we have a manga bee, uh, which at least on occasion gets into very hard foods. And on the bottom we have a silvery leaf monkey. And it eats uh, more leaves. Uh, and in the middle we've got a, a long-tailed macaque, which has a mixed diet dominated by soft fruits. If you look at their teeth, you can see that as you go from the bottom the, to the top, the cresting becomes heavier and heavier. There's more and more relief on the teeth. 
And this relates to diet nicely, not just in these old world monkeys, but across the primates, and in fact, across many mammal groups. All right, what about the hominins? They all have pretty flat teeth, actually. Australopithecus has flat molar teeth, even flatter than, say, a chimpanzee. Paranthropus has extremely flat molar teeth at a given stage of wear. And early homo, it turns out, has a bit more sloping molar teeth. I mean, they're not like carnivores, but more sloping than, say, uh, Australopithecus or Paranthropus. Tooth structure, and we'll look at average enamel molar thickness. Life is really more complicated than this, but the simple story, at least, is that if you look at closely related species, those that tend to eat very hard foods tend to have thicker enamel than those that eat very tough foods. Thick molar enamel is good for resisting breakage. It strengthens the tooth. Thinner enamel, on the other hand, allows you to wear through that enamel quickly and get to the softer dentin on the inside, which creates sharp edges, which are better for shearing and slicing. In principle, thick enamel could also be helpful for resisting wear in a very abrasive environment, since it's wear resistant. So this is what we see when we compare living species. What about the hominins? Well, again, life's pretty complicated, but the general take home message might be that on average, Australopithecus has thick molar enamel, Paranthropus has extremely thick, it's called hyperthick molar enamel, and early Homo has on average thinner enamel, especially from Homo erectus on. In sum then, large flat molars with thickened dental enamel and a diet of at least some hard, brittle, and perhaps abrasive foods is what has been suggested for Australopithecus. For Paranthropus, very large flat molars with very thick dental enamel and a di diet dominated by hard, brittle, and perhaps abrasive foods. Dominated, potentially, not just some. And then for early Homo, smaller molars with sloping biting surfaces and thinner enamel. And a diet, maybe some more tough foods, probably fewer hard, brittle ones. Tools may come into this picture as well for processing foods outside of the mouth. And in fact, there are animal bones with cut marks on them, which suggest that meat was at least included as part of the diet at this stage. So the traditional view gives us an Australopithecus. And yes, they lived in a broad range of environments, but the traditional view gives us an Australopithecus living typically in a more closed setting, although some certainly lived in more open settings, taking a broad variety of foods soft forest fruits, some harder items, and so on. And then, about two and a half million years ago, a fork in the road in one direction, our near cousins Paranthropus, in an open savanna setting, eating hard, brittle, abrasive foods, nuts, seeds, roots, tubers, what have you, and early Homo, with perhaps a broader diet, less specialization anatomically, maybe tools are taking over, but that broader diet including, presumably, at least some meat. Well, how does this match up with the traces of foods actually eaten, the food prints, as it were? Tooth size, shape, thick, and thickness give us an idea of what a species was capable of eating. In other words, what it was designed for. Tooth wear and chemistry, on the other hand, tell us something about what individuals actually ate on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, which is a very different kind of information. Both are important. Well, we can begin with microscopic wear on teeth, or dental microwear scratches and pits that form as a result of tooth use. And if you look very high magnification at a little piece of a tooth, this is about, represents about a tenth of a millimeter by 0.15 millimeter. This is a hard object feeding capuchin monkey, and it's got a very complex, heavily pitted surface. This is a leaf monkey uh, with, a, with a very simple striated surface. And typically speaking, Tougher foods, whether you're talking meat or leaves or whatever, leave simple striated surfaces across the mammals. Harder foods leave heavily pitted surfaces across the mammals. Australopithecus, low complexity. Lots of wispy scratches. Paranthropus, some low complexity, but some higher complexity, although variable. So a mixed signal with Paranthropus. Early Homo, low to moderate average complexity, but again variable. Very variable, in fact, in Homo erectus. The last line of evidence would be tooth chemistry. Where these hominins lived, there are basically two different types of photosynthesis going on. The ones that uh, tropical grasses and sedges do, which is uh, C4 plants, and the ones that trees and bushes and forbs do, C3 plants. And there's two different isotopes of carbon, for example, that are stable, carbon-13 and carbon-12. And depending upon the type of photosynthesis you have, you're going to select more against carbon-13 in one case than you are in the other, and that'll show up in the plants, and then it'll show up in the animals that eat them. 
So uh, browsers that eat forest products will tend to have a different uh, isotope signature than grazers that eat savanna products. When we look at the hominins, there are also some interesting differences. We find Australopithecus is a mixed feeder. Paranthropus, in some cases, they're mixed feeders. In other cases, uh, they seem to go for grasses or sedges. And then early Homo, which comes out as a mixed feeder. This isn't my work. This is uh, the work of many, many different individuals. But there are the results. The microware suggests a softer or tougher food diet in Australopithecus, on average. The isotopes suggest a mixed diet of forest and savanna resources. So far, so good. Paranthropus, the microware of some look like broader diets, including some harder foods. But for others, looks like they tended to focus more on softer or tougher foods. The isotopes of those that had broad diets, according to the microware, seem to have mixed diets in terms of where they were eating in the forest and savanna. The soft, tough item eaters, on the other hand, ate mostly savanna foods. So two different signals. For early homo, the microware suggests a mixed diet of softer, tougher, and harder foods. And the isotopes suggest a mixed diet of forest and savanna resources. So that's where we are at this point. Let's go back for a moment to where we started, to Dr. Adkin's pronouncement about what our ancestors of millions of years ago ate. And that is the fish and animals that scampered and swam around him, and the fruits, vegetables, and berries that grew nearby. OK, what do we know? Australopithecus likely ate mostly softer or tougher foods, things like fruits and leaves, in a mixed setting between about 4 and 2 million years ago, but could handle a fairly broad diet. Around 2.5 million years ago, there's a fork in the evolutionary road. In one direction, our Paranthropus cousins were more specialized and likely had different diets in different places. Some ate tough savanna foods like grasses and sedges, whereas others included more hard items in their diet, such as nuts and seeds in a mixed setting. Finally, our early Homo ancestors had, a less, had less specialized teeth and probably had a broader and more variable diet, including both savanna and forest resources, likely with more meat in their diets. And I just wanted to thank the organizers and CARTA and everyone else for the kind invitation for me to be here. Thank you.